1925, four years before the Great Depression, Twin One and Twin Two were born to Percy H. Medill and Gertrude Starkey Medill in French Camp, California, near the city of Sonora. They were later given the namesake Gertrude and Percy H. Medill Jr. Mike loved to joke, naming your child Gertrude or Percy is the reason why kids go crazy and kill their parents. Needless to say, he did not care for his given name. Percy Jr., Mike, as most knew him, changed his name multiple times throughout his life and many careers. Harry and Rita came from a long line of professional entertainers. Percy Sr. was an orchestra maestro and worked with the likes of Sophie Tucker, Al Jolson, and many other headliners of the day. Gertrude Starkey toured with her father, showman, and bandmaster, Will Starkey, and his cowboy band. Medill Sr. soon had Harry and Rita, the twins, signed up in ballet, tap, and piano classes. You name it, if it had to do with entertainment, Mike and Rita learned how to do it. As soon as they were able, he had them appearing in clubs and playhouses alongside Ethel Merman, Jack Benny, and a little-known act, the Will Maston Trio, starring nine-year-old Sammy Davis Jr. When asked about working with Sammy, Mike said, He was a hell of a hoofer, but he got on my nerves. He was always bumming cigarettes from me because he didn't want his uncles to find out he smoked. By the way, Mike was 11 years old at the time. Percy Sr. began to market the twins and soon landed them a gig with Wonder Bread. Their stage names, Rita and Rusty, the Sunshine Twins, were well known on West Coast Radio on Aunt Polly's Radio Hour. The late 1930s were the golden age of radio, and Wonder Bread's Sunshine Twins soon became a household name. Rusty and Rita were sent out on many promotions with Wonder Bread. One in particular in the spring of 37 included a short flight with a well-known aviator on her way to circumvent the world. Unfortunately, most of the photos of the Sunshine Twins were destroyed in the 1970s at Miss Rita's ranch. For obvious reasons, Rita and Harry were a popular pair at Sonora Union High, but most notably to their peers as drum major and majorette for the Sonora High School Band. In 1940, Harry took California State Champion for baton twirling, a title he cherished and even included in playbills and resumes for years to come. Harry, also known for setting multiple California State high jump and hurdle records, his signature catapult jumps and squared flips gave him an advantage on the field as well as on the stage. Classically trained, Harry Matil became a well-known dance instructor in Sonora and soon joined the Symphony Ballet, all before his 14th birthday. Harry took lead in several ballets by the Symphony. In Triangle, he was the featured soloist choreographed by Helen Moore Roberts. The symphony ballet was also the first time he used the name Michael Medill. It was said he could dance a mean Vesuvian and was known for an impressive Viennese waltz. Harry's waltz was a featured solo in the ballet Scheherazade. Between 1938 and 1942, Rusty Medill, childhood star, was transforming into Harry slash Michael Medill, the dancer instructor of acrobats, tap, Mike soon dropped the name Harry and shortened his name to Mike. In 1939, Mike teamed up with a childhood friend, vaudevillian and Broadway performer Frank Benham. Just in time, by the way, to make another historic name change. The Benham brothers were a post-vaudeville act dreamed up by Frank Benham and Mike Medill. While forming the duo, they toyed with different names. Mike noted the final choices on the back of an 8x10 proof sheet. We'll call ourselves the Tapsocrats, he wrote. He added Frank's choice, the Dunrights. Mike wrote Frank and Mike Benham by mistake, then below it wrote Frank and Mike Dunright to see how it would look. He stopped and thought, why not? And Mike Benham, Frank Benham's long lost unknown brother was born. The Benham brothers played a combination of old vaudeville circuit and many stops throughout the Midwest and Central US. They toured through Washington and California, then to what was known as the Borscht Belt upstate New York and the Catskills. Their final stop, Montreal, Canada, and then back the way they came. They had an appealing combination of vaudevillian flair and modern pizzazz. 
Frank's experience on the circuit and Mike's acrobats, technique, and youthful flair proved to be a great combination. One day, the Benham brothers learned the hard way never to do a radio show together. They were on West Coast Radio. Mike and Frank were asked at the same time if they were real brothers. Mike answered yes. At the same time, Frank answered no. The deception caused quite a bit of a controversy, at least in 1940s standards, until Frank's father, a well-known dentist in Dundee, did the boys a favor. While being interviewed in a Michigan newspaper, Dr. Benham proudly announced he had five children, one of which, Mike Benham, who was adopted. No one ever questioned their kinship again. And from that day forward, they always took separate radio interviews. The Benham brothers were asked back to many playhouses, concert halls, and clubs all over the U.S. and Canada. Multiple times they returned to Toledo in an infamous Quinoa Lowe's Chinese restaurant and theater. There they performed with many of the greats. Ella Fitzgerald, Bobby Darin, Helen O'Connor, Vivian Dale, and the McGuire sisters were just a few who graced the stage of Quinoa Lowe's. The Benham brothers played the Palace Theater, the Lotus, the Town Casino, and the Hotel Summit. They opened the Vogue Terrace, the Hippodrome, the Wedgwood, and the Capitol Playhouse. Mike's classical background, established technique, concert piano skills, acrobats, and tap was the perfect combination that led the Benham brothers to a floor show and a stage act success. Mike knew talent. He had an eye for showmanship and an even bigger one for success. He always looked for something new and unique, something different to bring to the stage. In February 1943, Mike was performing at the San Francisco Hilton Hotel as a single act. The older Frank Benham had already been called away to war. While on stage one evening, Mike was being heckled by an unruly drunk. The man yelled, can't be anything wrong with you doing all that fancy dancing. Why are you not fighting for your country? Mike was mortified. He looked much older than he was, and at just 17, he was not eligible to sign up without parents' consent. Mike was so embarrassed by the drunken man's spectacle, the very next morning, the 20th day of February, 1943, Mike forged his parents' consent, raised his right hand, and said, I do. Mike was stationed in San Diego with the 155th platoon. When they realized his talent, he joined other performers and started entertaining in the officers club. PFC Medill was not allowed in the club, so each evening they would issue gold bars to place on his uniform and then promptly remove them at closing time. This went on for a few months until the inevitable happened. In July, his platoon was shipped to New Caledonia, then New Zealand for training. Next stop, the front lines. Mike survived five campaigns during World War II with the 6th Marine Infantry 2nd Division, Tarawa, Saipan, Okinawa, Tinian, and the occupation of Japan. Mike Hofton said, I was scared as hell. My foxhole was the deepest and the widest in my platoon. Every time we went in, I cried the whole way, he said. It's okay to cry. That makes you human. I was scared to death. We all were. And anyone who tells you differently is lying. Out of his original 77 in his platoon, only 11 survived. After the war, Mike started teaching again, and true to his M.O., he was back on stage soon after. He hooked up with Frank Benham once again. They played the Palace Theater, Kinwa Lowe's, and all the standard stops along the way. Mike was a little older and definitely had gained some confidence and was tapping his way through a bright new future and career. The Benhams were receiving the best of reviews and the strongest of accolades, but the times were definitely changing and Mike needed to embrace the new along with the old. With the 1950s came the television. Mike got his feet wet in TV, taking a job as an assistant to Richard Barstow, director of the Milton Berle Show. Learning the ropes, Mike went on to direct the Patty Page television special. Mike was candid about his time with Miss Page. She always complained about looking too fat on television, he would say. She was as big as a house, but I couldn't tell her that. 
I put dancers in front of her, tables, chairs, whatever I could find. It was the biggest challenge I had. Directing the choreography was the easy part. Well, Mike must have done something right because soon after, he signed a contract with NBC Television and secured a position on the Lucky Strike Hit Parade. Time for a Lucky Strike Extra. The Hit Parade dancers featuring Bobby Trulis are in a flirtatious mood as they step out to that all-time favorite, Dinah. First time, Mike was able to show us how talented he truly was. His training, his obvious attention to detail, and all his hard work was finally paying off. Even the occasional stumble would be met with grace and poise and shown his talent strong and true. I know it isn't easy to resist temptation's call, but think of how your broken heart will hurt you when you fall. Cause someday you will find that you are hopelessly in love And she'll belong to someone else as sure as stars above Cross over the bridge, cross over the bridge Change your reckless way of living Cross over the bridge, leave your fickle past behind you And true romance will find you Brother, cross over the bridge Cross over the bridge There's no question Mike's training and attention to detail put him in a class of his own. Mike could jump higher and outmaneuver any on stage, and you always knew it was him when the acrobats began. Mike enjoyed a three-year run on the Lucky Strike Hit Parade. In 1953, Mike decided to go back on the road again. Frank Benham's classical and vaudeville background was great, but now times had definitely changed. It was time to up the ante. Mike met up with Gil Johnson in New York while working at NBC. Gil had been a childhood actor working on the Our Gang comedy series and was a talented singer and dancer, appearing in several summer opera productions. Gil was young and fresh and just what Mike needed to keep his career moving forward. Johnson and Medill were an immediate success. They took their unique acrobat comedy and singing act on the road. Little did Mike know, but he was about to embark on a tour of a lifetime. At one point, the boys had the opportunity to open for Bob Hope. Mr. Hope knew Mike from the hit parade, and the combination act of Johnson and Medill was off to a great start. Mr. Hope made them a permanent member of his personal appearance tour and television show. Mike is a solo act, and as Johnson and Medill toured with Mr. Hope for many years. Mike and Gil had worked all over New York City. 
Mike was also performing as a concert pianist with the Raven Page Orchestra at Radio City Music Hall. Through Mike's connections and downright groveling to their agent, on September 16, 1954, Johnson and Medill headlined Radio City Music Hall for the very first time. Gigs were easier to book after Radio City. What happened next was all about keeping score. They played the Palmer House, the Palace, the Palomar, and the Emporium. They danced Vogue Terrace, the Boulevard Room, and the Capitol House. They hit El Rancho Vegas, the Pirate's Den, El Cortez, and Town Casino. They played the Princess Theater, the Seville Theater, Bimbo's, and the Beverly Hills Country Club. Then one day they got a call from their agent asking them to make a last minute change. Eartha Kitt had ran into some trouble in Cuba and lost her contract at the Copa. The request was simple. Johnson and Medill were to catch the next direct flight to Cuba and headline the Copacabana. After Cuba, the sky was the limit. Oslo, Monte Carlo, Nice, Madrid, Brussels, India, Salon, Beirut, Barcelona, Port Said, Auckland, New Zealand, and Norway. They played the Moulin Rouge in Paris and the Savoy in London. Mike and Gil were a huge success in Europe. A heavy schedule took a toll on Gil, and Johnson and Medill broke up the act. Mike went back to Paris and studied for a couple of years, all the while performing as a solo act. Gil settled down and retired from showbiz. Mike loved Paris, but he needed to reinvent his act, so to speak. Back to the States he went and looked up his old pals Dusty and Suzanne. They were two regulars on the hit parade with Mike. Both were looking for something new, and Mike had what they wanted. A fresh new start. Suzanne Cancino, a.k.a. Camina Cancino, was the daughter of the late famous Spanish dancer and teacher Angel Cancino, and she was Rita Hayworth's cousin. With her connections, Mike's experience, and Dusty McCaffrey's talent, Suzanne and the escorts were born. Suzanne got them in with George Jessel's Showtime, and soon after they were back on the circuit. Chicago at the Palomar, Detroit at the Statler, the Brown Hotel, the Horizon Room, Montreal, and Cleveland. Then in 1958, George Jessel took the act on the Tivoli Circuit in Australia and New Zealand. Arriving by steamer, the SS Arcades, they were lead dancers in Jessel's Femmes and Furs, then performed as Suzanne and the Escorts, also on the same ticket. Mike Medill was just getting started. He still had another five decades of performing yet to come. 